This morning, I'll be speaking to us about the message that is titled, Enforcing God's Glorification Agenda for Your Life. Enforcing God's Glorification Agenda for Your Life. And to personalize it, Enforcing God's Glorification Agenda for My Life. Let's say it a minute. Enforcing God's glorification agenda for my life. Enforcing God's glorification agenda for my life. That title suggests to you that God has an agenda. There is no good manufacturer that does not have an agenda for his product at the time he's producing it. It's bad manufacturing principle. Not to have done your marketing, not to have done any survey, not to have put plans in place for the products you are producing. And I tell you in the business world, because businessmen are focused on making profit, they do all manner of researches. For instance, in Calgary, before an estate is developed, before they commence the building of a house or a high-rise or a commercial project or a residential project, they have done the survey. They have plans that there are people who are meant to buy these houses. No builder wants to build a house and nobody's, that nobody's willing to buy. So in other words, from the outset, he has failed. Our God, our Father, is the greatest businessman ever known. Shout hallelujah. So he has an agenda for everyone that he creates in the kingdom. Say, God, God has an agenda for me. Now, why do I say this? Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, one of the foundation scriptures that we'll be looking at. Say, I know the plans that I have for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. I know the thought in, in, in King James Version. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of good and of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So that expected end is a future that has hope. Is a future that is loaded. Say my future is loaded. And in Romans chapter 8 verse 29 and 30 in the message translation. Here's what it says. It said God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. Say from the very beginning. God knew what he was doing. He said he decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the lines as the life of his son. Will you describe the life of Jesus as a success? Please respond. Yes. Now, if you do, he said, I have decided from the beginning before I made you to shape your life like that of Jesus. He said the son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. So Jesus is the example first. And we see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. So whatever you can see in Jesus, that's exactly what God wants to make of you. If the life of Jesus was, was a success, God said, from the beginning, I have decided to show you the example of Jesus so that as you see him, that's exactly who I want you to be. Isn't that why the Bible then says in Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So, what you ever you see in Jesus, I am able to make it happen in you. Now, look at the next verse. It said, after God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. 
He followed it up. He made the plan. This is who I want you to be. An example of Jesus. And then he went to look for James and John and Peter and Sikak and Joseph and Emmanuel and Ahinome and called them by name. So your name was given from heaven. Your father, your mother may have given it to you, but your name is written down in heaven that in 2018, on October 21, at 9.16 a.m., a Hinome will be sitting in the sanctuary and be receiving what I want her to receive to make her who I want her to be. And after he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. So, when I called a Hinome, I put her on the same platform that I, I have. The same power. On solid basis means everything I can do, I have made her to, I have given her the potential to do it. He said, and then, after getting them established, so, Part of the process of God in bringing you to the image of Jesus is to establish you. Say, I have been established. He stayed with them to the end. Kadita Barada Patiya. In other words, I am not alone. You are not alone. You are on a solid basis with God. He stayed with them to the end. Gloriously. Let's say that together. Gloriously completing what he had begun. So every good thing that God has begun in your life shall be completed. There shall not be a aborted agenda of God in your life. Every good thing that you can imagine and think that the Holy Spirit is putting in your mind, he is able to gloriously complete it. That's what the Bible says. Not my words. His words. However, in spite of the good agenda, in spite of the good works and the good intentions of God, there is something to watch out for. And what is this? In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. Let's read this out together. For a great door, an effectual, is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. It is true that you have been called by name. It is true that you are loaded. It is true that you have been prepped up. It is true that he gloriously wants to complete what it starts in your life. He said, I have given you a great door. But there are many adversaries. There are many adversaries. There are many adversaries. What's the purpose of the adversary? There are many adversaries. We'll come to that very shortly. And one more scripture in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. It says, and from the day of John the Baptist until now. Say until now. John the Baptist represents the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. So from the New Testament, when Jesus died, until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violence will take it by force. Even though God's glorification agenda is beautiful, is loaded, but adversaries are waiting to distract you. And only the one who are violent, only the ones who are violent. What does it mean to be violent? We will understand very soon. Only the violent takes it by force. It will not fall from heaven on your laps until you demand for it. You have to take it by force. That's why we're looking at enforcing God's glorification agenda for my life. In other words, I'm insisting on the performance of the word. Luke 1.45. That he that believeth 
He that believeth. He said, and she that believeth. For she that believeth. There shall be a performance of those things which the mouth of the Lord have spoken. So, God, listen to me. You have to step up the game. Enough of this jelly-like Christian. Enough of this butter and bread mentality. Oh, God. Let me give the bread. The bread, the bread, the bread. Ah, the bread. No. You got to step to the territory of the enemy and demand what belongs to you and grab it by force. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. You're going to be taking it by force because it will not be given to you because the adversaries are waiting. The adversaries are lurking everywhere and hiding to say. And that's why so many great destinies have been sunk. That's why so many well-intended, good, purposed uh, plans uh, men, women, boys, girls with great potentials have been sunk because of the activities of the adversary. But this morning, somebody is escaping it. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the purpose of the adversary in the life of the believer? Why is the adversary opposing God's glorification agenda for you? Psalm 4 verse 2. Here was the psalmist asking the questions. Oh ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will you seek vanity and seek after listening? Listen means lying. Listen, many people, many wicked people live on this earth. The adversary is on the other side of God. The word adversary means opposite. So, there is always an opposition of your position. They are on the opposite side of your position. That's why they are called opposition. Opposition. On the opposite side of your position. The fact that you have opposition means that there is a true position that you are supposed to be standing, but the other ones are staying on the other side to distract you. It didn't start today. God has an enemy. Huh? Breaking news. God has an enemy. The Bible says, and there was war in heaven. In heaven. Where God lives, there was war. So on earth here, you think it's just going to be bread and butter? Wake up. Wake up to reality. Tell your neighbor, wake up to reality. Wake up to reality. Up to reality. Re Listen. Opposition is real. But more real is the victory that you have in Christ Jesus. Say with me, more real is the victory that I have in Christ Jesus. Why will you seek to turn my glory to shame? I just got promoted and somebody is angry to see me out of the job. I just bought a house and I shared the testimony and somebody is saying, why should he buy a house? I just bought a car and, you know, I just had a child. And somebody said, why should you have a child? Why? It's because what God has in store for you is huge, is big. And that's why the adversary is on the opposite side. So wake up. Tell your neighbor, wake up. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 27 to 28, they disciples asked Jesus a question. He said, so the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in the field? From whence had it tears? Verse 28. He said to them, an enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. So, enemy activities are real. And enemy activities are what? They are real. Now, why the adversary? Like I said, the word adversary means opposite. Opposite. In other words, opposite to the position that God has given you. Now, you must understand that it has been like that from the beginning. The devil was in rebellion in heaven. The Bible says, and there was war in heaven. But the good news is that there is set a day of judgment of the enemy. 
until that is accomplished, you and I need to stand true. God allows him to oppose you so that you can trust in God. That's why he allows the opposition to try to do their things so you can put your confidence and trust in him and depend on him. Listen, without adversity, there will be no pursuit of excellence. Sometimes when you know that you are being watched over something, you sit up and say, no, I don't want to be put to shame on this. I want to do it well. So, adversity helps us and drives us towards the perfect will of God for our life. So, in some of the things you will experience, there will be a man, a woman in one corner who will be the opposition. After all, in Canada, the way our system works is that there is opposition party. Why didn't we say the ruling party will just rule no opposition? Is so that they can put the main party under check. The moment they are beginning to do a, pro, a, a policy, they say, come, come, let's, let's gather. Look at section 5, subsection 3 of the Constitution of Canada says, no, it should not happen. And then they begin to go to work. That's why there is opposition. So we can show, we can pursue excellence. We can pursue excellence. Now, why is there opposition? To prove your stand in God and the sincerity of your love for God. To prove your stand in God. Where do you stand with God? If this God is truly God, where do you stand with him? Do you have just a mouth or a sense, a knowledge of God? Or do you have a spiritual knowledge of God? So it's to prove exactly where you stand. Why is there opposition? To make us better and strive towards perfection. That's why opposition is there. Why is there opposition? It's a part of God's grand plan to keep us focused in our relationship with him. When you know there is an enemy that is watching, you know there is a God who is willing to help you and catch you all the time. So you stand true to that God and you keep focusing on him and you keep depending on him. That is why there is opposition. So it is normal. It is expected to make you wake up and sit up and begin to take what rightfully belongs to you. That is why there is opposition. But this morning, I want, us to, I want to show us an example from scripture and how you can counter every opposition of the enemy and knock them back into position and keep yourself focused. And I see an example in scripture. Last week when we were talking, we said to ourselves that we need to pray about everything and worry about nothing. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Now please understand that that same line is what we need to keep Pray about everything, worry about nothing, but there is one more level above that which I want to introduce, introduce us to this morning. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 19 to 21, the disciples faced a situation that was beyond them. And here was what Jesus said. Just like some of you may be going through some situation, you are wondering what's the way out? How do I need to really get above this? How do I get to that next level? How do I make sure that the agenda of God in my life is not truncated. Here is the answer. In Matthew chapter 17 verse 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? Master, we were wondering. When you came down the mountain and you just said one word, the devil ran out. Why couldn't we do it? Here's what Jesus said to them. He said, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, remove. Hence, go to yonder and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Verse 21, let's read this out together. How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. In other words, for you to enforce the agenda 
of God for your life, you must not love food too much. You must be able to give yourself to a season of praying intensely, of fasting. But there are certain conditions which I want to share with us this morning. When you sense a strong opposition, a force involved with what you are dealing with, that is the time to call a fast. That's what Jesus was saying. He said, how be it this kind there are certain kind that will not go until you intensify that prayer with a fast. What does a fast do? A fast tears up your spirit man because you are empty and rid of carnal food. Your spirit man begins to desire a stronger food of the spirit, which is the word of God. And begin to quest and thirst and go to God. Fasting does not make God answer your prayer, but it makes your body subject, your, to, subject to your spirit so that you can rise above where you are and go in the realm of the spirit to take what belongs to you. That's what fasting does. He said, this kind does not go except by what? Prayer and fasting. When do you call for a fast? When you sense that your faith is getting weak. When you sense that your faith is getting weak, call for a fast. That's the time to use the force of prayer and fasting. When you sense also that this glory is being turned to shame, don't keep quiet. Don't watch. Don't watch. The enemy wants to turn the glory of God in your life to shame. And right before your eyes, wake up. Take charge. Wake up and take charge. When you sense that shame is about to come upon you, engage God in a fast. Engage a fast. When else do you call for a fast? When you sense a need for change. This thing has remained like this. No. It must not continue like this. Then you engage God in a fast. And I see an example from scripture. And this is about the apostles. In Acts chapter 2. We saw the long Standing promise of God. Before they, Jesus told them, you must not depart from Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So we saw that promise fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, verse 6a, the Bible says, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together. You know, that was, there was a loud bang the glory of God came down and the multitude began to gather from Acts chapter 2. So, the coming of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2 brought the glory of God down and men began to gather. Listen, when there is a loud bang somewhere, people gather. When we hear outside right now, what do you do? People's attention. That's what happened in the Acts of Apostles. The power of God landed. The glory of God landed in the church. And people began to gather together. So in that instance, we can say that the church was glorified. Now, Peter stood up and began to speak. His speech brought 5,000 people in one service. Say glory. glory. 5,000 people. Turn to the Lord in one service. At another service, the Bible says there were 3,000 people came. At another time, the Bible says the multi, they could not count them any, anymore. They said almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of God. What was happening? The glory of God came down and the multitude began to gather. So the church was glorified. But according to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Verse 9, a great door and effectual has been opened, but there are many adversaries. The adversary struck. struck. The adversary struck. So between chapter 2 of Acts and chapter 11, we saw multitude 
added to the church. We saw unity of the church. We saw miracles, signs, wonders. The cripple healed. Paul, Saul was converted and his name was changed to Paul. And the glory of God came down and they were experiencing great, great, great outburst of the power of God. The glory came down. But the enemy came thinking to turn that glory to shame. The enemy struck. Listen, that miracle job you got, it's not time to go to bed and sleep and say, yes, God has answered my prayer because I've got my miracle job. Every miracle needs another miracle to sustain it. But you see, we are many are deceived in the church. The moment they get the miracle job out the door, you begin to call them, where is this brother? Where is this sister? <laughs> my, my pastor, my job... My job, listen, as you receive that miracle job, the enemy goes to work. How do we take this job from him? How do we take this job from her? So it is not time to rest. It is not time to sleep. The church was glorified. The power of God came down mightily. The enemy struck. How do I know? Chapter 12. So between chapter 2 and 11, glory, beauty. But the enemy came, wanted to turn that glory to shame. In chapter 12, the Bible tells us that James was killed by Herod. Peter was arrested. The Bible says the Jews were very happy that James was killed. When he saw that they were pleased, then he caught Peter, hoping to kill him after a season. The enemy struck. So that you got that miracle, oh, I just bought a brand new car. You need another miracle to sustain that car. You need God to sustain that car. You need it to sustain the glory of God that has just landed in your life. You need God. So you will always need God. Say, I will always need God. That is why you will always need to be in Zion. The trick of the enemy from the beginning is to drive you out of Zion, drive you out of his presence. So when he strikes, he strikes well and takes that glory from you and turn it to shame. Say, God forbid. So you will always need God. And this is what, if you can get only this from this message, I'm glad. You will always need God. You will always need Zion. You will always need a miracle. Because every miracle needs another miracle to keep it going. So the enemy struck. Kill James. The apostles scattered. We thought it's glory. We thought we were enjoying the power of God and the glory of God. What is this that is happening? Then he caught Peter again and put him in prison. The church said, I think there's something we're missing. Then they began to pray. Then they began to pray. Then the church rose up. They began to pray. They prayed intensely and Peter was released. If they had prayed like that, James would not have been killed. Listen, brethren, if you keep your firing line on, firing in prayer, spiritual vacation is a risk. Tell your neighbor, spiritual vacation is a risk. Never you take a spiritual vacation, you know, there's no time for me to pray and fast right now. When I come back, I will pray and fast. Spiritual vacation is a risk, wake up. Spiritual vacation is a risk. That's what the church realized. So immediately, what they did, they set up prayer altars. Peter will not die. No, Peter will not die. This man will not kill Peter. This man will not kill Peter. And they began to pray. The, the killer became the killed. Herod, who intended to kill Peter, was killed. So when adversity arises, you need Zion. 
You need God. You need God. So they realized that and they began to pray. Listen, in chapter 13, the Bible says they prayed and they fasted to reinforce the glory of God. They prayed, they fasted. And when they did that, the Holy Ghost said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the purpose for which I've called them. The Holy Ghost came down afresh because there was a new fire. There was a new revival. That is what you need to do in your life, sir. So that your progress will be continuous and unending. Adversary may rise up, but when you also do not relax. There is an adage that says, When a hunter knows how to shoot without missing the bird, must learn to fly without perching. Christians seek not yet repose. Hear what your guardian angels say. In the midst of enemy you are. Watch and pray. Many need to hear this over and over again. He puts in your spirit. That when you get a miracle, stand on the line to sustain the miracle and take it to another level. Don't be dragged out of the church. Don't be dragged out of God's presence. Don't take spiritual vacation because the enemy is watching. So that the glory of God on your life will be sustained. You enforce it by prayer and fasting. There are things going south in your life. Correct it via prayer and fasting. Enforce the glorification agenda. After all, what God said is, I know the thoughts that I have and plans that I have for you. Plans of good and peace to give you a future and a hope. Call it back to order. Call it back to order. So what did we see? After they prayed and fast, fasted. In chapter 13, they prayed and fasted. And the Holy Ghost says, separate me, Paul and Barnabas. From that time on, go and read the book of Acts of Apostles. From that time on, there was no more mishap. In chapter 14, we saw Paul stoned. Listen. In chapter 7, Stephen was stoned and was killed because there was no power. In chapter 14, they caught Paul, stoned and stoned and stoned because the glory has come down. The church was praying and they fasted. That stone could not keep Paul. The stoning that killed Stephen could not keep Paul. Why? The power of God was present. The glory of God was come, was come down. So, what happens to others and destroys them may happen to you, but it is not permitted to destroy you and to take away the glory of God upon your life if you know how to enforce it. Where are prayer and fasting? After all, what is food? That you cannot deny yourself for a season. Some will say, well, another quarter fasting is coming. Okay. I'll wait until that time. Eh? You want to wait today to get your miracle? Call it fast now. You are sensing shame. You are sensing that your faith is weak. You are sensing that the enemy is praying around. Call it fast. And listen. This is Canada. I know how we, we make sure that our children don't fast. Teach your children to fast. You say, ah, my children, ah, my child, my child cannot fast. Hey, well, who says? You want to see glorification on his life? Teach him to fast. I started fasting when I was age five. I started fasting age five. Fast in nine o'clock. <laughs> After I grow a little bit taller, fast at twelve. You want to see glory? Sir, ma, that's the way. You want to see glory? That you want to sustain the glory of God on your life, teach them to fast. 
Don't say they are too small. When they grow, no, it's from that small age. Teach them to fast. Command them to fast. So, Paul could not be killed in spite of the stoning. In chapter 16, Paul and Silas were caught again. They were put in jail. But now, the church is alive. The jail could not hold them anymore. The Bible says they, their hand and feet were kept in the stock. They had never done any of the apostles like that before. He said, these people, let's even intense the way we hold them in this prison. The way Peter escaped from prison the other time, now we need to tie down Paul. Tie them in that prison. Put a host. It doesn't matter the level of adversity that arises. That's not what matters. What matters is the level of where you stand with God. The level of empowerment you have. The level of power that is available with you. Listen, the devils are subject to power. The only language the devil understands is what? The language of power. The language of force. Get out, you foul spirit. That's why when you are rebuking the devil, when I ever watch me when I'm rebuking the devil, lose him now. Get out, you foul spirit. Get out, out the door. That's the way you, that's power. That's what the devils understand. Lose him now. Get out. The language of power is what the enemy understands. So empower yourself in fasting, in prayer. Enough of this jelly, jelly Christianity that we're playing today. Shout a loud hallelujah. hallelujah. So Paul also was involved in a shipwreck. He was involved in a shipwreck. The ship threw him under the water. The ship broke up. He went under the water. Guess how many days he was there? Three days. Was he a fish? But he was alive. The shipwreck could not kill him. Why? Power. Say power. power. Say out loud power. power. When the church is empowered, no devil can succeed against it. So get up. Wake up. Understand that the language that forces the enemy back to order is power. I'll share this with us in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6. It says, is not this the fast I've chosen? What does the fast do? Say with me, to loose the band of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And Break every yoke. That's what a fast does. Lose the band of wickedness. There is always a band of wickedness that the enemy is trying to tie around you. Lose it very fast. Undo the heavy burden. Some will say, I'm feeling heavy in my spirit. Pastor, I can't pray. I am feeling heavy. Then call for a fast. When you feel heavy, what do you do? Call for a fast. He said to undo the heavy burden. To let the oppressed go free. To break every yoke. So every time you sense every plan of the enemy around you, call for a fast. And force the glory. Where a fast. Look at verse 8 of the same chapter. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Your health shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness will go before you and the glory will be your rear guard. In other words, righteousness is going before you. The glory of the Lord is coming behind. Say, you cannot touch this one. He's standing in power with me. You cannot touch him. The glory surrounds him on every side. Zechariah 25 he said, I will be the glory in the midst of her and I will be the wall of fire round about her. This is happening via the fast. Shall we rise up this morning?